Like, you're a wanker. I'm, I'm a wanker. That's for sure. I wouldn't say that. Was well, this is what we were saying. Wanker wanker from that. This is why when you guys at the bowl shop, we were saying there's two types of people in the world. Those that are willing to tell their shit story and those that, that everyone oh. has a shit story. Oh, yeah. Oh, everyone's my God. Gone. That's a podcast introduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's two types of people, man. Is that what you call I am recording. I am recording. Oh, no, actually, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm actually recording. G'day and namaste and welcome to Arts vs. Life podcast. I'm your host, Felix, and for the first few episodes we're just going to go through some of my writing and after that I'll get into some deeper conversations and other material. You can find me on all the usual social media, but for now let's get into the stories. Everyday Magic, part one. It better be funny. Here we are. You're listening to this and I'm reading it. The best advice you could ever hear is to not ever listen to anyone's advice. But we both know you're not going to do that. So I guess you should listen to this instead. From here, I can't be sure what you need to understand, let alone what you would like to understand. But I do know something that you don't. So let's start there. When asked, if forced to condense it into a single sentence, most people would say something like, I just want to be happy, or something like that. Why are we here? What's it all about? Do I have a purpose? Does life have a meaning? And if so, what is it? These are genuine questions and well worth consideration. However, if you're honest, they all fall somewhere down the list from your own happiness. And that's okay, really. Happiness flows. By seeking it for yourself, it has a tendency to spread to those around you. Even when selflessly seeking it for others, be they your children or family, community, or simply charity, it often washes back onto you no matter how much you bail it out onto others. Happiness, as a thing, will always find a way to leak back in. You just have to let it. Sounds simple. A platitude. Fuck platitudes. Inspirational quotes won't save you drowning. They are funny to see on a poster with a kitten and maybe they give you a kick in the butt when you need it. But words are just that. Words. If the timing is right, they can motivate you and make you feel better. But without the energy or physical implications, they are just another blip on your mental radar. A point of reference. Great. That's not what you need, however. What you need is strong hands. So how can you be happier? It's so simple you're not going to do it, but I'll tell you anyway. Make more jokes. They don't have to be good jokes, or even ones that other people think are funny. It doesn't matter. Not all of us are born with the timing and charisma of a stand-up comic, and that's not what I'm asking of you. Laughter is the best medicine, as they say, but that's on the receiving end. What I'm saying is, Find life funnier. The more entertained by life you can be, the less of a victim of it you'll be. Sure, there are qualities of life that measurably benefit from a sense of humour, from your health to interpersonal relationships and even personal finances. However, what I'm saying here is that if you can develop your understanding and sense of humour to the point where even on your deathbed, you can still give a ha-ha like the character Nelson from The Simpsons, then you've achieved something that very few humans ever do. So, start there. Seems simple, huh? It might even be fun. A sense of humour is not just important to you as an individual, but vital to a functioning community. The role of a medieval jester was profoundly important, not just to the royalty, but also to the plebs. A good joke, a true joke, has a life of its own, and there's nothing more dangerous than a human being who takes themselves too seriously. They say the first death under fascism is laughter. Everyday Magic, part two. The time I pretended to be a neo-Nazi and it was the right thing to do. The city I've spent most of my adult life in has an unusual fetish for its public transportation system. Someone, sometime, turned to 1800s light rail network or trams, into an icon that is postcarded and plastered throughout any and all official city propaganda. 
It's odd, but that's my hometown. It's a great leveller, in a physical sense. A thing we all share and complain about in equal measure. Like our notorious weather. This is what democracy looks like. The only reason I mention this is because it's the setting where this story took place. This is a true story. It's too weird not to be. One day, whilst on a fairly full aforementioned tram, light rail or streetcar if you're from Frisco, we pass through this inner city suburb of some renowned. For the most part, this city is very safe and comfortable, being one of the most traditionally multicultural cities in the country. However, it still has its problem areas. This area, despite the steady march of gentrification, has a habit of being the most popular vagrant and junky hangout. That's fine with me. Everything has its place. But it does create its own set of issues. One of those being that commuters from the richer and hipper suburbs to the north and the east of this location have to traverse it on their way into the city centre. A local philosopher and comedian wrote a whole album about this particular tram line, but I won't get into that. I only mention it to emphasise just how interesting this ride can be sometimes, and the special place we locals hold for it in our collective public transporting hearts. On this day, the tram was almost full. Almost every seat was occupied, and there were many people standing in the aisles. However, I had a back seat to myself. Without a detailed description of the tram itself, these things are typically laid out like a train carriage, with two bench seats facing each other in booths, so that the seats back into each other. Sounds complicated, but what it means is you sit back to back with the person in the next booth. What this geometry meant was that on this day, I sat with the whole booth to myself looking forwards, down the carriage, so to speak, but only the people riding the tram backwards were facing me. All this is important to how the story happened. Sitting in the booth in front of me, with their backs to me, was a neo-Nazi and his wife. In the booth opposite them was their daughter, a preschool-aged girl with curly blonde hair and an observant, eager expression. She faced me, seeing me over her dad's shoulder, but they couldn't. The other people in the carriage occasionally shot glances their way, but didn't try to occupy the one spare seat next to the kid. The couple must have been only in their early or late 20s, maybe early 30s, but they were dressed pretty punk, and, as I mentioned, he was clearly, at one time or another, a neo-Nazi. How can you tell? Well, the huge swastika tattooed on his shaved Caucasian head might be a start. You don't have to be an anthropologist to figure that one out. You don't need to be a historian to know what an SS patch means when sewn onto a jacket and worn post-1945. But I knew, because I was, and am still to an agree, on the exact opposite side of that coin, being someone who was involved in the scar punk movement. Without getting off into the weeds, it's kind of fascinating how these two movements are ideologically opposed, often violently so, yet to an outside observer may seem, and often act, identically. Both groups were popularised about the same time. Both listen to punk music and dress like punks. Both shave their heads and have tattoos. Besides a few key indicators that you would only know if you belong to either scene, like the colour of someone's bootlaces or braces or specific patches or band logos they display, it's very hard to tell which group someone belongs to. Another detail, but it's also a disclaimer. I directly and unapologetically oppose everything he stood for politically and will until my dying day. That being said, I was at the time also an adult white male with a shaved head and visible tattoos. Six foot three inches and a hundred kilos with Scottish blue eyes white male. Like it or not, an Aryan ideal. Which may explain why I had the back seat to myself. Sprawled out as I often have to be to fit my large frame into such places which often leaves little room for company. This is the scene, the setup. The tram is rolling along, stopping occasionally to let people on or off at designated stops. The couple in front of me are chatting with the girl, pointing out landmarks and being good parents. I sit quietly behind them and observe as I do, like most artists do, spying on life. The tram doors close and it rolls off from a stop, Suddenly, there is a heavy impact on the window right next to the child's head on the outside of the tram. She jumps, in fact we all did, and then started to tear up a little, obviously shaken up by the surprise. 
The blow was hard enough to cause the driver all the way up the carriage to hear it and stop the tram, unsure if some kind of incident or accident had taken place. Then we heard them, a couple of young junkies or rough trade types banging on the outside of the carriage. They had run up to the tram as it was leaving a stop and had chased it down the street in traffic. When they caught up to it, one of them had jumped and pounded on the window with his fist. He wasn't aiming for anyone, just lashing out and attempting to stop the huge metal beast on its tracks. It worked. But mostly due to the shock and awe factor. The driver stopped and opened the door to give them a piece of his mind. But they were on, and now they were all of our problem. This is what democracy looks like. I don't know what stage of their drug addictions they were in, if they were too high or too sober, but they were agitated in a way that only addicts can get. They weaved their way through the crowd like caged lions, making a fuss and being crass. They had the confidence of people who really didn't care if they hurt anyone because they didn't care if they hurt themselves. I could see the body language of the couple in front of me. Although the little girl had calmed down and was now just interested in the ruckus going on behind her, the wife was visibly tensing up and the Nazi was hardening up. She was squeezing his hand. A code was being sent. An intimate physical morse. Do. Not. Please. They were coming. Not intentionally, but they were still coming. Arguing their way down the tram towards us still yelling at the driver and generally being dicks. Maybe I'm psychic, maybe I've witnessed a lot of violence, but I knew what was about to happen, 100%. Nazis, even of the neo kind, are not renowned for their gentle natures. As they approached, he couldn't hold back anymore, and with surprising restraint told these boys exactly what he thought of them. His point was legitimate, and they had scared his kid, but these boys were having none of it and rounded their drug fueled anger in his direction. They kept coming. He was getting ready. And I had no doubt in my mind that this Nazi was going to rip these junkies apart. It would be messy. Real violence isn't like a Hollywood film. It ain't clean or swishy or fun to watch, really, even if you're into that kind of thing. I only had a second or two to do anything if I was going to do it. After that, it would all be clean up. Witness statements, crying, incidental bruising. I took stock of the child. Her expression read clear. Not again. Not again, Daddy. Don't go away again, Daddy. Don't let them put you away again. Young as she was, this wasn't her first rodeo. Now the two junkies had worked their way down the length of the tram and were almost upon us. If I was to act at all, it was now. I locked eyes with the closest troublemaker. In complete silence, and with him as the only audience, I very deliberately pulled off my cap. It was the smallest thing, but I knew, in his eyes and from his perspective, one Nazi had instantly become two. He might be a crazy junkie, but he still had a base level of survival instincts. The Nazi stood up and I bulked up without standing or breaking eye contact. They stopped dead. Two junkies might be able to claw down a single Nazi, but the odds had just shifted. It wasn't a fight anymore. Two Nazis meant they were both going to hospital if they were lucky. The Nazi told them to fuck off and they retreated with only a few grumbles, peering back over their shoulder at us. Us. He sat back down and I put my hat on again. Only me, the kid and the junkies knew what I had done. Which wasn't much. Let's be honest. But it was the right thing to do. We may have been enemies, in one sense, the Nazi and I, but it doesn't mean compassion was impossible. You don't have to love someone or love something to have compassion, but I'll talk about that later. So why this story? I'm not asking you to step into my shoes or consider what you would have done in this scenario. It was such an unusual set of circumstances that I honestly don't know what I would do if somehow presented with it again. I'm not a good person or desire that you think that I am. So I wasn't at all trying to convince you of my virtue. No, I think I'm trying to illustrate how sometimes the right thing to do isn't something you would think yourself capable of. It may be counterintuitive. It may be surreal. It may go against all you hold dear. But when the time comes to do the right thing by the world, it may not be as hard as you think. Just a little confronting and confusing. And that's as it should be.
Everyday Magic, Part 3, Killing Kittens. Don't be misled by the title. I love cats so much I was named after it. That's why, if you were wondering, I spell my name the way that I do. I wasn't born with that name, but changed my real name to my nickname and later tag when I was a late teenager. In case you're not Australian, we have a habit in this country of renaming things. It's kind of a cultural twitch. If you have red hair, you'll often get the nickname of Bluey, because blue is the opposite of red. Somehow, in Australia, that makes sense. If you have a short name like Tim, you'll become Timbo or Timmy. If you have a long name, it will be shortened to a single syllable. Nadine becomes Nads. Phoebe will be shortened to Phoebes. Michelle's are obviously Shells, and many Fiona's are simply Fees. It's very Australian. My birth name is Philip, which in Australian is obviously Phil. And during the 80s when I was a child and busy establishing my nickname, there was a Saturday night variety show on television that was very stupid and popular and contained a sketch character called Lucky Phil. It's strange not only because I was really lucky, but also Felix as a name traditionally means lucky. It's pure coincidence. They started calling me Felix in high school because I have an uncanny affinity with domesticated felines, and Phil likes cats, and Felix the cat are just not far enough apart. The spelling is all my late teenage ego confusion and confidence. It's a nice but long word to graffiti. The internet didn't really exist then, so I had no idea it was such an original thought, but it suited me ever since and confused many a housemate when family calls asking for Philip. Growing up where I did, as we called it, next door to butt fuck nowhere, I was lucky to escape with that name for life. It could have been much worse. The place itself was actually quite beautiful, and had a variety of qualities depending on the cycle of the seasons. I am very lucky to have grown up caring what phase the moon was in, not for fluffy hippie reasons, but because on nights with a full moon you could walk around without a light and see almost like it was daytime but with this weird, surreal effect and deep shadows. We often went hunting on those nights, as you didn't need a torch so much or even at all, and hey, every other creature was too. It got into your blood. It was hard to sleep because of it. It was totally animal. There was this small granite outcrop about a kilometre from our farm, still is I guess, that wasn't much, but was still the nearest, highest point around, and for that reason it became significant. We picnicked up there, and flew kites we had made as a family. I was primary school age then, and have some very 80s sepia photos of us up there as a family. As I grew older, and bolder, my parents would let me walk or ride my bike up there by myself. It was as safe as anywhere else on the farm, just with bigger boulders. I knew about snakes, I knew how to climb, I knew how to fall, I knew how to limp home a mile or so in tears, holding something bleeding, snot running down my dirty little face, the quivering lip thing kids do. I knew. It was fine. And I soon graduated to a motorbike and shotgun and solitude. That was my idea, not my parents. They are missionaries and pacifists. The gun was a spare one I'd loaned off a friend's dad. It was unregistered and old and apparently had killed someone. But we thought it was a suicide, and so it wasn't a bit of evidence or anything. It wasn't haunted or anything. It was just an old single shot, 12 gauge, like in an old western. The type you snap in half like a hinge to reload. It wasn't a double barrel, get off my porch rocking chair type. Just a single solid metal barrel. Nothing fancy. Just wood and steel and some springs, but it worked just fine. And probably still does. When I returned it, I'd lost the piece. Not an important one, but still, his dad was really mad about it. We looked around for it in the paddock, but it was gone. It didn't matter, but I felt bad about it. It didn't have a sling or a strap, so I used to have to balance it across my lap while I rode the motorbike, which is possible because it was a step-through type, like a postman uses. So I had a lap to balance it across. Unloaded, of course. I was a dumbass kid, but not that dumbass. We knew how to use guns and not use guns. We regularly killed things with them. We knew how dangerous they were, but also how fun. And I don't know you or your experience, but all of this might sound like a foreign land to you. 
I remember finishing my day at high school, which I hated for the most part, and then playing basketball or drawing until sunset, then racing up the hill to see if there was anything about. Sometimes I'd see foxes, but never got one with my shotgun. Foxes are indeed very sly animals. But they were prized not just for their skins, which were worth money if done right, but on a farm they are a real menace. If they got into your chickens or ducks, they wouldn't just kill one for dinner. They would destroy and distress every bird they could. They were apocalyptic that way. Scorched earth tactic. If I saw them, I'd have a shot to scare them or maybe wound them. Sometimes I'd use this weird little whistle that makes a sound like an injured rabbit to try and trick them into coming within range. But they rarely did. Feral dogs were really bad and often travelled in packs. They could be scary. They stuck mostly to the deeper bush than the farms though, where they had plenty of native animals to destroy. I would see but not shoot at kangaroos. Not up on that hill. They were lost if they were up there. But in other times and places, yes. They were pests sometimes too, but not like foxes. I didn't shoot at birds very much either, except maybe crows when it was lambing season. I would never kill a crow now, and do have a special place for them in my heart, but they can be a real nightmare. I won't go into details, but they have a taste for eating sheep's eyes, and that's as much as I'll say. So you'll forgive me for firing off a few blasts of my shotgun and mouth at these monsters after finding some twitching little crime scene in the dirt. Rabbits, however, were a different story. It wasn't at all their fault. They were just being rabbits. They were not evil or malicious like foxes or feral dogs or crows, but they were more common and much, much worse. They nuked native vegetation and farm alike. And if you're not from rural Australia, perhaps you don't know or can't imagine how bad they can be. It's a long story, but in short, when Europeans came here about 150 years ago, they brought with them some rabbits and foxes for a bit of fun, releasing them to prosper so they could have a bit of ye old English style sporting pleasure. As far as introduced species go, they were devastating and still are. But sadly, not the only example in this country, or even the worst. Rabbits breed quickly and eat almost everything, destroying baby trees and therefore forests and anything at all within reach leaving little for the remaining very passive native species and displacing them from their underground shelters. They make vast warrens that erode and divert creeks, altering ancient watercourses and bogging tractors occasionally. It can be dangerous, not just annoying. And because they breed so quickly, they can swell to plague proportions very quickly and this country has many examples of that and some extreme measures taken to attempt to quell them. We didn't just hunt rabbits. We were at war with them. Even before we had guns, we were taught to hunt them, and taught just how bad they were. They could cost you the farm. Literally. If the men went out spotlighting, which is modern fox hunting Australian style, we kids also went, boys and girls alike, and had our first goes at shooting at them with a .22 baby rifle. The big kids had shotguns. We all liked the shotguns. These nighttime adventures were always pre-planned and much discussed during the week, as they usually took place on a weekend night. A ute, or truck with an open back tray, was fitted out with these huge rotating lamps brighter than the sun, and when it was time, we all put on layers of old warm clothes and borrowed gloves and piled in the back of this freezing vehicle. It was great fun, but you had to be quiet. Then we'd drive around the farms until we saw something and depending on what it was, kill it then collect its corpse. We'd take turns and make jokes, but sometimes you had to sit dead still and quiet, breath fogging in the lamp's laser beam, so that one of the dads could have a go at getting a fox with a much longer range, and therefore much harder to use large calibre rifle. The boys bragged about the shoulder bruises, and the girls not so much. Well, some girls. Women are generally better shots than men after training, if they're into it and were built pretty tough in the country. But a lot of girls are too smart to enjoy being repeatedly punched in the shoulder with a cricket bat, so lose interest before most boys do. Needless to say, by the time I was riding the motorbike up the hill with a shotgun across my lap, I'd had some experience. I'd seen and done some things that I've now blocked from my memory. It's hard to explain if you didn't grow up that way. Shooting rabbits wasn't just some after-school fun. It was a job. 
It was a war. I remember enjoying the sport of it, but not the death. I didn't like killing things, but hunting was challenging, and there was always a few rabbits around up at the rocks, so it was worth a ride if I was in the mood. The view from up there was pretty amazing, and I think someone brought it since and has built a house up there because of it. To the south, during winter, you could clearly make out a few of Australia's highest mountains and the snowfields. Yes, Australia does have seasonal snow. They're not Alps at all, but on a crisp winter's day, they cut an unmoving pure white cloud around that horizon. To the west, it was more of the same for hundreds of clicks, but superb sunsets as the sun shone through all that dust of inland Australia. North was a higher, but much more natural hill that we all left alone for the most part. I only ever went up there a few times, and it didn't feel welcoming. It wasn't special, just another rocky bump covered in trees. But for some reason, everyone in the area just kind of avoided it. Some parts are like that, just left alone. To the east was my family's farm, and what's known as the Tabletop Mountains, a strangely ignored part of the Australian landscape, and no doubt at one time a very special place for the Indigenous people that once lived there. If you have ever driven from Melbourne to Sydney via the highway, you've passed this mountain range, but on its least flattering aspect. If the highway ran the other way around it, as it used to, and as the train line still does, then the sightseeing spot would be established where my hill was. The view was superb, and has found form in many of my landscape paintings since. I would park the posty bike in a gravel quarry and then climb the granite outcrop, and sit for hours just watching it, watching for any movement in the grass. One evening I remember climbing over the highest of the lichen covered boulders, to find a family of rabbits cavorting in the flat ground behind. To the side of them was their burrows, a series of unengineered holes in the ground that they ducked in and out of. I had been stealthy getting up there, and the wind was blowing away from the setting sun, helping to hide me and my approach. They were blissfully unaware of me and my shotgun creeping over the rocks towards them. I lay belly flat on the ground, using my elbows and knees to quietly shuffle forward, It's known as tiger crawling in the army, until I was about the right distance away. Shotguns are not like in Hollywood films. They only have a very short effective range, and beyond half a length of a football field or so, are virtually useless. The little pellets just becoming a hot shower by the full length. So at this range, I could not only be close enough to be deadly, but because the lead sprays out in a small cloud, I could probably not just get one rabbit, but a few. The shotgun is really overkill for rabbits. Not at all cost effective, but it's what I used and the idea was to kill them. So overkill was better than underkill. I had all the power right now. All I had to do was control this situation. I slid the gun forward, calmly and slowly, resting its old wooden butt in my young shoulder and cocking my head like a violinist to peer down the solid metal barrel, taking aim. The gun had no sight or scope on it, just a raised metal bump at the business end that served somewhat as an aiming device. Shotguns were easy like that, which is why they are used so widely in hunting. You didn't need to be very accurate, just the right distance away and blast generally in the correct location. Shock and all. Looking down that barrel as a child was like lying on a cold grey metal pipe that disappeared into a distant vanishing point, beyond which, when you refocused your eye away from the pipe, was your target. My favourite book when I was a lot younger had been Peter Rabbit, and that same copy still occupies my bookshelf. I cried the first time I watched the movies Bambi and Watership Down. Before me was one of those scenes, a family of rabbits bouncing around and chewing on the dry grass and playing. The parent rabbit sat watching and fussing over the kittens. Yes, baby rabbits are called kittens, or kits and with the setting sun behind them and brilliant Hollywood backdrop colour, the whole picture was, well, picturesque. It was cute, adorable, completely passive and peaceful. An illustration from a kid's book, a cutscene from The Rats of Nim or any other fiction about the lives of field animals. I paused, finger hovering over the trigger, mouth dry. I could kill several vermin in one shot, which was good. Reloading the snap-open single shot was a hassle to do, 
and took more than a few seconds, even at the best of times. So I only had one chance at them. One shot. From here, this blast should be able to pepper most of them. I waited, heart pounding. I loved animals, even then. Tears began to well up in my vision. I blinked hard to try and clear my eyes. It didn't work, and I let them dribble down my cheeks instead of wiping them away. Such a movement would surely spook them, and this one chance would be lost. Rabbits scare easily and hide fast. I pulled the gun in tighter. I slowed my breath, preparing to fire. I had to do this. It was the right thing to do. In six months, all these critters would be having just as many critters and probably suffering from disease or starvation, or even worse, being afflicted with the terrible effects of myxomatosis. Yes, a plague we humans released to counter the previous plague we had released. Or just more food for more foxes. Me, or somebody like me, was bound to shoot them sooner or later. Probably me. I was saving myself the trouble of doing it later. And in the meantime, these animals were going to do untold damage by just existing. Right here and now, it was not just the most efficient course of action, but the most humane. I had to kill as many as I could, right here and now. My friends would have. Our fathers and fathers' fathers would have, without hesitation. But I don't know that. Tears totally obstructed my vision. I tried to blink them out. My lip trembled. I tried not to shake. My heart ached. I heard my teenage friends' voices mocking me, calling me a pussy and telling me not to be so soft and just do it. I closed my eyes completely. I felt my heart beat once, twice, and pulled the trigger. The boom of the gun covered my howl of release. I'd been so quiet this whole time, and now with this huge sound echoing off the hills and trees and rocks around me, I yelled back at it, screaming out my inner turmoil. I stood up and wiped my teenage face, the smell of gunpowder and cleaning oil deep in my nose. I didn't reload. Behind me and to the east lay my home, and beyond that, the view. A weird blue bite taken out of the deep-coloured clear sky and approaching night. The distance between me and it, a void of shifting, abstract colour. I reluctantly began to walk towards the sunset and the spot that I'd shot at, dragging my feet. I didn't want to see what I had done. But I had to. I was responsible. I was a murderer. It took a few minutes and I sobbed all the way. Shamelessly. The way you do. The way you only do when you're absolutely alone. I approached the spot, expecting to see the worst thing I've ever seen, and that's saying something. I had seen and done some truly awful things. I was prepared for the worst. A tangled mess of fluff and blood and pitiful sounds, but when I wiped my eyes, I saw nothing. No horror show. Nothing. I must have pulled high or too low when I closed my eyes, and had missed. And I was grateful that I had. Where the family of rabbits disappeared to, I'll never know. Perhaps I injured them, and they all made it back underground to die later. Maybe I just scared them all half to death. Maybe I'd vaporized them. I'll never know. And I never saw them again, so far as I know. Maybe I did shoot one or two of them later. I'll never know. I sat down on the spot and wept uncontrollably. I was weak. I was pathetic. I should have killed them. I should have been more ruthless, more mature, more country. I had done the wrong thing by them and myself. It was hard to understand that sometimes a massacre is the correct thing to do. This was one of my first memorable adult moments. I don't remember if I was still upset by the time I climbed back on my bike and rolled down the hill in neutral to my place. I don't remember if I talked to my parents about it or if I was still shaken up by it. I never told my friends. They would have made a joke about it, with me as the butt. My nickname then would have been Bambi or much more likely Wuss or Mighty Soft. That's how people out that way cope with difficult issues. You just have to laugh at them. 
I can't explain why, but war history has always been of interest to me. Even as a child, I was really obsessed with it. I can't tell you why, I just don't know. And the one event that always bothered me a lot was the American bombing of Japan at the end of the Second World War. Specifically, the dropping of the two atomic bombs over Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Even though the firebombing campaign previously was arguably more devastating, I could never justify such an act, and literally for decades used it as my go-to reference for the epitome of human evil. The worst humans could get. Sure, the Nazis had gas chambers and industrial genocide, and absolutely the Japanese visited some of the worst crimes ever performed on their occupied territories and prisoners. But still, I held in my heart that the nuking of Japan was the peak of humanity's horrors. How could instantly char grilling an entire civilian city be anything but wrong? How possibly could such indiscriminate murder ever be justified any way that you look at it? Right? Wrong. With further study and research, listening to first-hand accounts by those involved, expert historians from then and now, and understanding the history and culture of Japan at that time a little bit better, I now understand. I still don't like it, but I don't have to. It was the correct thing to do. I can explain, but it's better to understand it yourself in your own way if you're at all interested to do so. It wasn't the only option left to the Allies, but it was the most efficient. And efficiency when you're talking about world wars isn't just a capitalist, profit-driven equation. We're talking about years of suffering, on all sides, and millions of deaths potentially. We could still be fighting that war now. Like it or not, I have slowly arrived at the conclusion, in my mind, that it was actually the best of all the options available at the time. America was on the right side of history, as unbelievable as that may seem. And you don't have to agree, I don't expect you to. I would simply encourage you, if you have an opinion about this piece of history, to dig a little deeper. Maybe you'll come to a different conclusion, or maybe you'll understand it in a completely different way. I'm open to suggestions. This is why whenever I hear someone say the phrase, the right side of history, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and maybe yours should too. I think about those bomber crews flying away after dropping a nuke, a metal taste in their mouths. Because really? Are you prepared for that? When I hear someone say that, I hear them justifying pulverizing Hiroshima. Are you really prepared to do something horrible? To do what's right? Are you sure about that? Are you killing kittens? The Inquisitors were sure they were on the correct side of history and morality. They tortured thousands in an attempt to save the souls of their victims, according to their philosophy. The Nazis believed they were right too. So did the psychotic communists, every time that utopia has ever been attempted. So, can you pull the trigger? Could you, or would you, have killed those adorable and blissful rabbits? Are you the monster you'll need to be to be correct sometimes, to do what's right by the future? Or are you just killing kittens because you can? Because you currently hold the means to do so? I guess all I'm saying is be very, very careful of being on the right side of history, or anyone who claims to be. I actually love rabbits, and kept some as pets later in life. Charming animals, really. So thank you for listening today. Although both of my stories contain aspects of violence, I would want to be clear that I am in no way advocating acts of extremism. The exact opposite is, I hope, the takeaway message. We should all find ways to be more compassionate towards each other, the world around us, and ourselves. That, in my opinion, is the one thing we can all do to make the world a better place. I would love to hear your feedback. So feel free to hit me up on social media at Art vs. Life as one word. I also have a BitChute channel and a YouTube channel with more art-related content. And of course, feel free to do the do and share this around. Until next time, take care out there.